I don't understand how we can ultimately dismantle any of it if we don't stick to a to a you know intensely radical politics. You're not broke if you're taxing rich people. We break production for profit and we replace it by production for need. This event is brought to you by Haymarket Books. Now, more than ever, it is critical to support independent publishers, independent bookstores, and independent voices. There are two ways you can do this today. First, by buying books from Haymarket at haymarketbooks.org. And secondly, by joining the Haymarket Books Book Club. The following event will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. Please subscribe to the channel like this video now and share it with as many people as possible. If you like this event, be sure to catch these upcoming events in Haymarket's live stream series. You can register for these upcoming events on the Haymarket Books Eventbrite page. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. We are moderating the chat but we cannot guarantee that everyone will observe our community guidelines. People who violate these guidelines will have their comments deleted as quickly as we are able. This event will have live closed captions. Instructions for accessing the captions will be posted in the chat. We should have time for Q&A, so please post your questions in the YouTube chat window and we'll get to those later in the program. Thanks for joining us today. Our event will begin shortly. Welcome everyone. I'm Erica Foreman from Haymarket Books. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. We're incredibly honored to bring together Seema Yasmin and Stephen Thrasher for what I'm sure will be a brilliant conversation in honor of Seema's debut collection, If God is a Virus, which we had the honor of releasing just last month. A little bit about our guest and our featured reader this evening. Dr. Seema Yasmin is an Emmy award-winning journalist, medical doctor, disease detective, and author of If God is a Virus. She was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in breaking news reporting in 2017 with her team from the Dallas Morning News for coverage of a mass shooting. 
Yasmin is a disease detective in the Epidemic Intelligence Service at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where she chased outbreaks in maximum security prisons, American Indian reservations, border towns, and hospitals. Currently, Dr. Yasmin is a Stanford professor, medical analyst for CNN, and science correspondent for Condé Nast Entertainment. Find her at SeemaYasmin.com, at Dr. Yasmin, and Instagram at Dr. Seema Yasmin. Stephen Thrasher is a Scientific American columnist and the Daniel H. Renberg Chair at Northwestern University's Medill School and a faculty member of Northwestern's Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Much Anticipated, The Viral Underclass, How Racism, Ableism, and Capitalism Plague Humans on the Margins from Celadon Books and Macmillan Publishing. So honored to have you both here. So I'll kick it over to you, Stephen. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much, Erica, and thank you to Haymarket for hosting us. Uh, it's a real honor to be in conversation with Dr. Yasmin, and uh, I really love this book. I'm really excited to hear you read from it and talk about it. And we were talking right before, and you said you had a poem you wanted to read from somebody else uh, about Palestine, which I think is a really appropriate way to begin our conversation tonight. So what would you like to read to us? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Erica, as well, both for the kind introductions and for making this event happen. The poem that I would like to read is by another poet, Noor Hindi, and the poem is titled, Fuck Your Lecture on Craft, My People Are Dying. Colonizers write about flowers. I tell you about children throwing rocks at Israeli tanks seconds before becoming daisies. I want to be like those poets who care about the moon. Palestinians don't see the moon from jail cells and prisons. It's so beautiful, the moon. They're so beautiful, the flowers. I pick flowers for my dead father when I'm sad. He watches Al Jazeera all day. I wish Jessica would stop texting me, happy Ramadan. I know I'm American because when I walk into a room, something dies. Metaphors about death are for poets who think ghosts care about sound. When I die, I promise to haunt you forever. One day, I'll write about the flowers like we own them. When I die, I promise you I will haunt you forever. Um, one of the things I find so beautiful about this book is that you are doing something that's very difficult for us as journalists or, or scientists or medical doctors um, often, which is to actually give language to these phenomena that we are trying to describe and poetry gives us a space to get there and how is poetry I guess just to start off our conversation um, how is poetry helping you connect with or make sense with or, or find your feelings about what's happening in Palestine and how has poetry been the way that has brought you to share what you're thinking about the world with viruses in one really simple way, Stephen, poetry slows me down. It even slows down my reading, um, which is just really useful, even in a time of crisis, I have found. When I was thinking about these poems, I was actually on assignment as a journalist, right? So thinking very much about, and we can get into journalistic objectivity and new framing of the story. And I'd been sent to West Africa, uh, to Liberia, not at the height of the Ebola epidemic, but towards the end of the epidemic. So end of 2015, early 2016, I went to Liberia, which was very interesting timing because it's when a lot of Western journalists had left mm -hmm. because the case counts were declining, thankfully, and the death rates were declining too. And so it was like the story is over and the story really was not over and the story really is not over still. So I arrived when, yes, the epidemic, you could say the peak was definitely declining, but there were tens of thousands, maybe more than 20,000 people who had survived Ebola, but whose lives were not the same. People who ha were having vision problems and hearing problems and mental health issues, whose joints were aching, people whose families and communities did not welcome them back because of the stigma around being somebody who'd survived a virus, right? Not our first time kind of contending with that kind of sentiment, but it was playing out so 
publicly, so loudly, and yet there was very little interest in journalism about this being a story, this story of survivors. So I had gone, and that's the reason I got support from the Pulitzer Center, because they support journalists to tell underreported stories, and Ebola survivors were apparently to many people not that interesting, and therefore it was underreported. As I went very much with my reporter's notebook and I did my uh, assignments to Scientific American and PBS and the Dallas Morning News. And yet, I mean, I read poems all the time and all the time I was thinking, especially this point about the limitations of journalism, the constraints that we have put on it, the things that I felt I had to do to be a professional journalist and working at a newspaper. Um, and yeah, and, and testing those limits with my journalism, even subtle things like insisting on using first person the first names of people and not the last names. My editor was like, why? We don't do that. That's weird. And I was like, I'm just looking for more ways to humanize people. And since we generally are not in the military and generally we use people's first names, like, can I try that? And so I was pushing limits, I guess, and then thinking about what work poetry might be able to do that journalism wasn't allowing me to do. Mm. And certainly not a new idea, uh, you know, to think about documentary poems. There's a book I have from, I think it was published almost 100 years ago, The Book of the Dead by Muriel Rukeza, um, in which she documents this awful tragedy that happened in West Virginia in 1931, where hundreds of men, mostly black men, died while digging a tunnel. And she uses interviews uh, with family members, she uses legal documents, court records, death certificates, all of this to craft this one really long poem that is the Book of the Dead. And I, you know, documentary poem, poetry has been going on forever. There's really recent um, examples too. And I was thinking of what constraints there were in both journalism and poetry, what overlap there could be, and how I might use poetry to interrogate the limitations and norms of journalism in ways that perhaps I wasn't able to do in journalism itself. That's so interesting to hear. And um, I started writing for Scientific American not that long ago myself, and I, I didn't know until I did that they, they are publishing some poetry now. And they published poetry, I think, in their original editions more than 150 years ago. Um, so poetry is this beautiful thing that can help us understand the world. I would love to hear more about what was your sense as a journalist in terms of the limitations of how you were expected to be objective. And this is something I, I think about a lot. Um, my colleagues, my students think about a lot. And to my uh, pleasant surprise, I think journalism as a whole has been reckoning with it much more broadly, particularly uh, in light of the Black Lives Matter movement last summer. And um, and lots of ways that consciousness has been raised. But I'm curious to hear what were the limits for you that you felt imposed upon you and how did you navigate that as a journalist? And then how is uh, poetry either given you a space outside of that or also maybe helped other journalists you work with understand that um, we don't always have to be quote unquote objective. Yeah, and, and what does it mean? Who ob objectivity? So I'm looking back at Nora's poem because I was thinking the title is Fuck Your Lecture on Craft, My People Are Dying. And I'm like, wait, as soon as you said objectivity, I was like, fuck your lecture on objectivity. Like, people are dying. Um, one of the core required readings in my journalism class here is Lewis Raven Wallace's book, The Myth of Objectivity, right? The View from Somewhere, Undoing the Myth of Journalistic Objectivity. And the history, like, I never learned that in journalism school, actually, the history of why objectivity became a thing in journalism. And that history is fascinating just in terms of the profession saying, oh, government, go away, like we'll police ourselves and here's what we're going to do. We're going to be fair and neutral. Like I just even these terms are so frustrating. And again, it applies to journalism and you were saying earlier, but to science and to medicine as well. This idea that scientists are these neutral arbiters, that we are objective as if we don't exist within a political world, as if we leave our biases outside the newsroom or outside the laboratory before we step in. So even before I went to cover the Ebola epidemic, I was dealing with those instances, those uh, 
questions those arguments every day. And I would come home and describe them as microaggressions, right? Because because and my mom was always like, it's never micro, it's always a macroaggression. Um, because it was the conversations with editors about what is a story and what isn't a story. And there's a poem about that here too. Mm-hmm. Um, and even actually, you know, Erica mentioned that I had covered a mass shooting in Dallas, very close to the newsroom. It was horrific. And one of the things that happened in the 36 hours of mayhem straight after when the shooting, when none of us had slept and we were just on the go, on the go, filing copy from wherever we were sent, was I had noticed that there, the Dallas Police Department had put online a video of a, a black man who had been at this peaceful Black Lives Matter protest and said, this is our shooter. So they basically put a target on this man's back and he was an innocent man. And we had a one inch brief on him in the paper. And so when I was looking at my story, I saw that and I was like, oh my gosh, he could have been murdered. You put his picture on Snapchat and social media and said, this is our shooter, when you didn't even know how many shooters there were or where. We're back. So, uh, yeah, and we're back. We had a technical glitch. Um, so I was just saying about this horrific mass shooting that happened near the newsroom. It's all hands on deck. We're all covering it. And the next day, I mean, there was just so much mayhem as there always is with these horrific incidents. You don't know how many shooters there are, who actually was the target, what's going on. But in the middle of that chaos in the night, it turned out the local police department had put online a photo of an innocent black man who was at a peaceful protest and saying that was the shooter. And I was horrified. And yet I had to really fight to be able to report that story. And when I was saying, oh, we covered it as a brief, therefore we must have contact information for him, his lawyer, something, someone's covered it. And it was like, no, it was aggregated. I was like, okay, but let me find the information and interview him. And this is a really big story. It's a story about 2A rights and for whom those rights matter in Texas. Um, And it's just, you know, things like that every day that I think, um, resonate with many journalists of color. A few of my colleagues and I were creating this toolkit, Stephen, that's called like uh, the survival kit for journalists of color. And in, in creating it, we were reaching out to journalists from across the country and saying, send us things that have happened to you. And it's just the same thing over and over and over. And so um, poetry for me was another way of interrogating those biases that the new, the framing of news, even those discussions around what is news and what gets left on the cutting room floor. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I, when I've taught Lewis's book and met, met Lewis, I think a lot about how understanding our subjectivities doesn't make our work weaker, it makes it stronger. Mm-hmm. But there is something really, and I think there's something very powerful about when we can bring things to the table that are specific to the story. Mm-hmm. I've only covered um, one mass shooting, it was Pulse. And I just happened to be awake when it was happening at 2 or 2.30 in the morning when I started seeing news about it on Twitter. I was writing for The Guardian at the time, and I connected with one of our editors in Australia who was on shift over the weekend and started arranging the breaking news coverage. And then I wrote an opinion piece, didn't really sleep and got on a plane and flew down there and was there Mm -hmm. for the next week. Um, And it was a really, I don't, I hadn't done, and I don't do that kind of breaking news that often, but I really threw myself into this experience. Um, And it was really informative for me to embrace my identity as a queer person of color. I stayed in uh, the Parliament House Motel, which has now been closed by this pandemic. Um, but it was a place that was both kind of a flop house um, for for gay men. It was a place where many people worked at Pulse and at the bar at this place uh-huh. and the club at this place. And so it was an extremely different experience reporting that story over the next week um, in breaking news settings and having arguments with editors about the ways they were trying to frame it, often, you know, white Brits in London sort of trying to impose a point of view that I was saying, like, we really, this is something that's very specifically happening in a Latinx community, Mm -hmm. quite actually very much in a Puerto Rican community. We need to look at the context of why so many young gay Puerto Rican people are even living in Florida in the same place. Um, And even though they were viewing it as sort of a gay story, it was more complicated than that. But it was a story of something that happened to service workers all, all, many of the people at Pulse were service workers themselves and their friends. Um, and so they're all working until one or two in the morning, even though they might be mourning, their, their friends were still working until one or two in the morning. That's when you can start reporting the story when they're not working. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. that kind of perspective makes the work richer, I think, than 
sort of hunting for a sense of objectivity. Um, the other thing I was thinking of when you were talking about poetry is I, I think being a reporter can really be in the beat, uh, the beat tradition of poetry of sort of getting to hear the wonderful ways people talk. Mm -hmm. And my friend, AJ Bauer, who's a journalist and journalism professor, uh, I, I tell him he's poetic and he rejects it. He says, I'm not a poet. I'm just a journalist. The world is the poetry. And mm -hmm. then I told him, well, that's poetry itself. <laughs> right. AJ. Um, but it is a beautiful thing to get to go out into the world and sort of listen to the poetry around us as a journalist. Yeah, for sure. And actually, now you're making me think that somebody said when I wrote some of those pieces from Liberia that the inflections and perhaps the tone of people's voice came through. And I was thinking, yeah, that's right. I don't edit my quotes in any way to make them meaningful or, you know, intelligible to mostly majority English speaking um audiences, especially as somebody who write who writes as opposed to false video or uh, that was really or audio that was really important to me. Yeah, but thank you for sharing your experience about covering that, um, that awful, awful night. Um, I yeah, but I do recommend Lewis's book as a really, really good starting point, especially for journalism students contending with this idea, this myth of objectivity. And I like the way it goes through the history and gives you recommend source material as well to really help you understand where the myth came from and who that myth of objectivity actually serves. And I think we mentioned earlier, I don't know whether it got cut out because of the glitch or not, that you were saying about the what your lived experiences, the communities that you come from, the languages that you speak can all lend itself, can all empower perhaps your reporting. And yet what we saw happen last summer after the murder of George Floyd was a black journalist in Pennsylvania be told, no, nah, you don't get to cover these, you're black, you'll be biased. So let's talk, that's a good moment to talk about how viruses are always around us in these situations. So in Pulse, I didn't write about this in the time, I, I found out about it much later, um, but apparently the, the police that went in uh, were stigmatizing about being worried about the blood or, and because they thought maybe it'll have HIV because mm -hmm. people were gay. Um, and of course, one thing that we've learned from HIV, which uh, has been quite a blessing so far in the coronavirus uh, epidemic, is to understand universal precautions. And yep. there's no need to sort of treat any situation. And, and it, But it's still kind of confounding me to think of a police officer walking into that kind of scene, that much death, and sort of fearing HIV in this illogical way. Um, yeah. And that also makes me think about how, which I, I'm writing about my book, I wrote a piece about it in Slate last year, mm -hmm. that George Floyd, in his autopsy, he had the coronavirus. Um, and, you know, would he have died from it? We don't know, because he was murdered by Derek Chauvin. But it is yeah. interesting and sad to see that these sites of violence yeah. in the United States, I mean, I can speak to it best in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, are both sites of violence and they are also the sites of where people are going to be most vulnerable to viruses because yeah. these are created out of overlapping forces. Right. And then the aftermath, too, because I, the, the thing that I wrote about Pulse, I didn't cover it as a breaking news event, but I wrote about the FDA's anti-science nonsense protocol around, at the time, banning men who have sex with men from donating blood and plasma products. That's changed a little since then, or it's changed a lot since then. But at the time, you know, there was a shortage, I believe, and one of the ways that communities wanted to respond was take my blood and use it to save the lives of victims. And of course, at the time, if you were MSM, you couldn't. And that went against the evidence, you know, it went against our public health mantras of it's not who you are, it's what you do that puts you perhaps at a higher risk of particular infections. But what you're saying also reminds me about not just police officers, but stigma when it comes to healthcare personnel too. Um, I am the daughter of an AIDS activist so my mom was an AIDS activist and a care worker of people with HIV AIDS in the 90s. And so I kind of grew up with that um, and the, the kind of activism around that. And 
went into medicine partly because of it. And I remember just once I was a hospital doctor, having patients, uh, patients, having colleagues come, sometimes be honest and sometimes lie a little and say, oh, you know, um, Mrs. Jones's veins are really difficult. Would you have a go? Or Mrs. Smith has HIV and I'm really scared. Would you take her blood instead? And it's like, yeah, okay, but really? Like, what? You went through how many years to not really understand, you know, how to protect yourself or what the risks are? So it's perverse and pervasive, um, these fears and stigma and beliefs that we have around viruses. Well, I actually have a different point of view on um, on the blood ban, which is something that I've written about. Uh, I wrote about it like 10 years ago, and I've thought about it, not written much more since. But the FDA ban was homophobic when it was banning people around identity, saying if you've had sex with a man since 1977 as a man, you can't donate again. And they've since revised it a couple of times and now mm-hmm. said if it's within 12 months, now I think it's three or six months. Mm-hmm. Um but one of the things I find very interesting about it is a lot of the, first of all, the, the blood donation donation industry is a multi-billion dollar industry that predicates itself on getting people very worried about um, getting access to blood. Yeah. And then for, it's been interesting to me to see that a lot of gay men want to donate in a way that they often think that they can't means they're dirty in a way because they're thought of having HIV. Mm-hmm. And a big problem with it is that the FDA had this long ban that was about identity and not about activity. Mm-hmm. But I found it very interesting. I've like, if you've been incarcerated within a year, if you've had a tattoo within a year, you can't donate blood. Mm-hmm. And I've never heard sort of prison activists talk about it in the same way that gay men talk about it. I think they should be, though. Um, I think they should be. I mean, I can't donate blood here because I lived in England during the mad cow disease. Right. And- BSE crisis. But that's interesting. You make a really good point. You make a really good point about incarcerated communities and activists. Um, So tell me um, more about how maybe, and this is a way to to get into the reading of your poems. uh, How did you actually, at, at a craft level or sort of at a practice level, begin actually writing the poems? Did you start writing them while you were in, while you were in the field um, reporting on Ebola? I think I may have taken some notes that lent themselves to poems, but really it was when I came back and I lived in D.C. at the time. Um, Sorry, no, I lived in in Texas at the time. And then later when I lived in D.C., I was writing poems in both of those places based on what I'd seen and what I was still seeing um, in in the dynamics of the Ebola epidemic and the coverage um, of the Ebola epidemic and the humanitarian or aid response uh, to the crisis as well. So the poems mostly came after. After. There, I, I felt very journalistic, and I had, you know, I was on deadline. So there was some notes that I took, but really, it was when I came back. Um, and I think at the beginning, I wrote, I was writing very angry poems, and I was writing a lot of poems where the speaker was a survivor of Ebola, and the speaker was somebody who I had spent time with, whose wedding I had attended, whose family I had spent time with in Liberia, and. The only two of those made their way into the book because I was like, what am I doing? I don't I don't want to be that. I don't want to be writing from that perspective and because I was trying to get away from the journalistic perspective and actually wanted to interrogate my role as a journalist, my role as specifically a public health doctor. And then also what happened is the the poems evolved to give voice to the virus and to personify the virus and to think about the virus in different manifestations. So that was my process because I was writing the poems over about four or five years. Yeah. Mm. And I also liked how you said that it helped you slow down. Um, Because when I was in graduate school and often when I'm in deadline, I, I, I I hate to say this, but it's ruined a lot of the pleasure of reading for me. It makes it very hard for me to slow down and enjoy reading. And poetry does that. I can take something by Sapphire, Sharon Olds and actually like really focus on the words because there is no narrative drive to figure out what's happening as quickly as I can. Um, and it's brought me back the pleasure of reading in lots of ways. Yes. And I would imagine maybe as a, as a journalist as well, the writing of it too, that you're not on deadline and are really getting to think about every word. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And even the ways that lines and poems stay with me, um, 
you know, the way that many of us will read a headline nowadays and be like, what officer involved shooting what racially tinged what and we you know we talk about well journalists need to be deliberate with words and i often feel like maybe maybe we are but we're using passive tense to absolve blame or whatever um but with poetry it feels so deliberate like i can almost imagine the, the poet like scratching out a word and or being like no that word can't end this sentence it has to go in the next stanza worrying excessively about the white space and the enjambments and all of that and actually something like this happened this morning um there are some high schools that are teaching this book and when i was talking to one of these high school classes an english class earlier this morning here in california via zoom um there was a young woman woman who said to me you know there's this line and it's from a poem that I'll read later she said there's this line in there and I was like that line doesn't make sense she was saying to me because you were talking about babies in shallow graves and then you went straight to maple syrup and I was like what is she doing this doesn't make sense and then she said but the next day I was like oh I get it and I was like Yes, that's what poetry does to me too. It does confuse me sometimes or it does like jar me. It does stop me in my tracks and then it marinates for days and days, I think. And I don't want to keep like always comparing journalism and poetry. I don't want to do a disservice to journalism because there's so much incredible journalism out there. But for me, at least for my literary brain, poetry has a way of like marinating in my brain and stopping and, and staying there, lingering, I think, more <laughs> than journalistic writing does. There's a line in one of the many poems named If God is a Virus in the book um, that I've, I've already referenced to people. Uh, 8% of your genome is viral. We are literal cousins of ancient pathogens, wretched offspring of pandemics. And I've thought about that. It's a, it's a beautiful way to think about how we are viruses. They are part of us and they will always change us. Um, and it's such an interesting counterpoint to fears that that vaccines are going to change your DNA. <laughs> I was trying to explain to somebody, no, the virus is, like, if you don't get vaccinated, it's going to change your DNA. Um, and they have, historically, they have. They have. Uh, and I'll just tell you, because you mentioned one of the, like, the poems it's called, If God is a Virus, that this morning, right before I was joining the high school class, the Pulitzer Center, which was sponsoring and organizing these high school visits, said, oh, and by the way, they love your poetry book and they've been studying it for weeks, but it's a conservative Christian high school, so you're not allowed to mention the title of the book. And I was like, wait, wait, what? And logging into Zoom, like, I can't wait, what? Well, I don't know. Um, so that was very interesting. Um, but yeah, and I'm, you know, by some estimates, it's 8% of our genome is viral, maybe 12%. And then there's another poem in the book later on, also called If God is a Virus, that talks about our evolution and our ability to have placentas that fuse properly, um, that ability likely comes from a gene that was derived from a virus. So you could argue that our literal survival is dependent on our ancestral viruses that we carry with us, yeah. So uh, on the, the, title, the title of the book and yep. the title of several of the poems, If God is a Virus, I, I found it provocative and beautiful. I, I often think that viruses are among my most imp important teachers, um, mm -hmm. you know, particularly because I've learned so much from AIDS history and HIV activism, and mm -hmm. it has created such a building place from what we're experiencing now uh, across society. Um, yeah. How did you come to that title? I wasn't thinking about it as a title for the book at all. I was thinking about it when I was thinking, what is a virus? Because I think of it in so many ways. And I think we have this weird binary conversation in science. We always get stuck at, are viruses alive or are they not? And really, they are both. But then how can you be both? And in what situations are they both? And I really love that debate, even though often it's like, whatever, you just carry on with the work. So I was thinking, what are they? And I was thinking of them as omnipresent and omniscient entities, which for me, as someone who was raised in a really, really religious Muslim uh, community, makes omniscience and omnipresence, I think of God. And I was thinking, what if they are some version of God? And 
then I started writing multiple poems with that same title. Like, if God is a virus, who is she? And I'll read some of those. If God is a virus, is she Muslim? Like, if God is a virus, is she a sea creature? Like, just really basic. If God is a virus, does she work at the border? Does she do border patrol? Like, I don't know. And I was just thinking of all these different things that it could be. And then when it felt like the right title for the book, I started literally losing sleep. And I remember saying to my mom, like, this is not healthy. Like, I am so stressed that this is what I need the title of the book to be because my family back in England and in Saudi, they're going to they're gonna just think this is so blasphemous. And interestingly, last month when um, we had a, a launch for the book as well, somebody in the audience said, you know, I really love these poems. Can you tell me how I can encourage family to read it because they're not going to like the title? And I was thinking, dude, you tell me. Like, I don't know. And I actually, I think I came up with a pretty good response at the time um, and kind of saying, you know, I'm, I'm come from a religious background too. And it's not about, it's maybe provocative, but it's not about trying to be blasphemous. It's really thinking about the, yeah, the omniscience and omnipresence of, of viruses. But that stressed me out in January. Then I just had to draw a line, Stephen, and be like, it is what it is. I'm a creative person. This is going out in the world of my family. You can just they'll be all right well why don't we hear from we hear you read from the book okay thank you so i'll start with um one of the if god is a virus poems if god is a virus she is a muslim woman in charge of the remote control and human evolution eight percent of your genome is viral we are literal cousins of ancient pathogens wretched offspring of pandemics it's why we colonize, unsatisfied with commensal living. A virus is your grandmother reincarnate, at home in your bone marrow, watching TV with a remote control wrapped in too much plastic. I dated this girl who said her hijab was a virus, kept the white boys away, only brown girls immune to the hate. We wrap ourselves in aluminium kafirs because our scalps are aflame with rage burning with the heat of six sons who became six terrible men. That is how your grandmother ended up in your marrow, eating salted watermelon seeds, drinking apple tea, and spitting out dysfunctional white cells. Mm. And then I can read Beautiful. another. Thank you. This is the first If God is a Virus poem I wrote. If God is a virus, Phytoplankton drips down her thick thighs as she stirs a primordial ocean with her toenail. Striped fish slap in God's ankle bracelets. Along the coastline, she drags a tangled seaweed braid. If God is a virus, she is naked. Shed her nucleocapsid when salamanders grew legs. Now she is two strands of misdense RNA, acid ladders reaching to the heavens. God is in your fever, in your dandruff, between your teeth, crying in the permafrost, massaging her way out of a mammoth's trunk, a bison's tailbone. She is having sex. God is making babies in your tender lymph nodes, giggling when you prod the swollen knots. God is pregnant, parasitic fetus suppressing white cells. God is an infection. Her incubation period as long as three sermons on the mount. Replication rate amplified by saline, sweat, and fear. A virus gave you a gene called sin so you could grow placentas. Sin fuses baby to mother, fuses uterus to placenta. A virus blew air inside your drowning baby's pigeon chest, put some respect on her phospholipid membranes. Watch God's fat molecule shimmer, her flagella undulate. If God is the virus, we are over, over and over again. Reborn absent pinky toes and coccyx, spines seven degrees more erect. Praise the holy fevers. Pray for split-brained migraines. Mm. I was even thinking, um, you know, one of my relatives in the Middle East recently had COVID 
and it was really scary and she's an extremely religious person and it happened during Ramadan so a very holy holy time for us and I was even thinking of like how religious I used to be as a, a young person and trying to make her feel better now that I'm an adult and trying to, to help her think positively that coach she'll get over the COVID and thinking that I was so religious as a young person that we, you know, that I was thinking when it says pray for split brain migraines, there was a part of us that um, believed that, you know, when you suffer and you are sick and you are feverish and you sweat, there is absolution and you are forgiven your sins. So even that kind of praying for suffering from a God, praying for a virus, because you feel like that will, yeah, wash away sins. Um. This is uh, that that's really beautiful, and I I love the idea of, of just the way that you're thinking this through and using the virus as a way um, to think about the nature of our lives and the makeup of our bodies. Um, you also have a poem that's about a computer virus, yeah. And and I wanted to ask you, uh, how have you? It's something I'm wrestling with myself right now. Um, how how did you start to think about literal viruses and what they're doing to us and the ways that we think about virus metaphorically? Yeah. And I'm also curious, do you feel like there's been a shift in that between the time that you're reporting on Ebola, which of course was of enormous concern to the people who were affected by it, yeah. uh, but there's just, I think, there's just a much broader consciousness about viruses in the world now that is quite different than with uh, probably any time since maybe 1918 um, yeah. for, for the human race all at once. Yeah, no. And I think that's, that's changed how we are thinking about them. Yeah, and in fact, that poem is called If God is a Computer Virus, and it's right next to the If God is a Virus poem that I just read. I think at the time, I was grappling with the idea of viruses at their base level, at their base units. So this idea that as someone who studied virology and did lots of research actually on a coronavirus about back when the first SARS epidemic was happening, I was in a virology lab, kind of coming to terms with the idea that what I was putting in a Petri dish and watching was a unit of code wrapped in some fat in a you know it was kind of like in a bit of a fatty bubble but really it was some code um and then that's what got me also thinking quite obviously i suppose about computer viruses and the poem that i've written is about the i love you um computer virus which was hugely successful depending on how you define success but it spread rampantly and did so much damage and cost so much money so I was thinking of it in those ways. And then certainly, as you said, I'm writing this like over five or six years. Even there's a poem that I might read later that has the phrase PPE in it that I don't explain. And at the time I was thinking, people aren't gonna remember that it means personal protective equipment, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with them having to go and search it online or something. And then of course the book comes out during a pandemic when we wear PPE every freaking day like would you have anticipated that like you know right right <laughs> they're everywhere you will find a mask that's shoved somewhere um in one of your pockets or drawers and so yes i think we are reading more about viruses i think we have viral fatigue not just in the infected state but in like oh my god i'm so over this like can we you know maybe not just talk about viruses all the time but that's really what I was grappling with is at the base unit, what is a virus? What are the different ways that we can think about a virus or even grappling with it numerically? Like there are so many more of them than there are of us and always will be. And there are so many undiscovered viruses too. There are a couple of questions I wanna bring into the mix um, that have come in from the audience. One is in your career, have you found that writing on public health has become any better or less racist and homophobic generally than it was in the past? Or do you think it's gotten worse? I think what has changed is perhaps, perhaps a little, like this much more space in the mainstream for queer voices, for non-binary voices, for pause voices, I think. That might have changed a bit. When I was growing up, I read those voices in what felt like more niche outlets. 
So I think some more of those perspectives are coming in. But then I think those of us trying to do the public health reporting better are also leaving newsrooms because we're underpaid and overburdened and dealing with microaggressions, you know, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. And there's only so much you can take. Um, So even being cynical and skeptical, I want to say it's gotten better hopefully. And I say that as someone who reads a lot of literature that's kind of more current but retrospective looking at the HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, and so I feel like, oh, there's more analysis, there's there's more material out there. So maybe that makes me think more, it's getting better. But at any point, it can just, it, I mean, there's still so much, so much homophobic, xenophobic rhetoric baked into, still baked into public health reporting. So I was, lot. yeah. I, I think that there's um, there's such a diff, there's a much wider access to different kinds of media, which is great. Yeah. Of course, this is happening in yeah. the uh, in the context of economic conditions that face that affect us generationally. So it's hard to make progress for the people doing the work. It's easy for them to get burned out and not be supported. But a lot of my problems with a lot of media I've looked at around HIV and AIDS. Mm. Some of the media has been very problematic, but the bigger the bigger problem is that there wasn't a variety of stories. Mm. And since I first kind of published my first critical thing about AIDS narratives three or four years ago, there's so many more of them. Now, a lot of it through poetry. Uh, Brontes mm-hmm. Purnell, um, uh, Jericho Brown, just won you know, the, the Pulitzer for poetry. Mm. Michael Jackson's musical A Strange Loop won the po- Pulitzer uh, for uh, playwriting. Um, Pose, you know, is bringing lots of narratives. And I, I taught today my students um, about ACT UP, and I found a lot of them had first heard about ACT UP through Pose. And so I'm just glad that there are wider, there are like more narratives coming into the public consciousness. I think there's, because of this pandemic, there's more interest in them too. Yeah. Um, and we'll have but, your book. When is your book coming out? Hopefully in March, I hope. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you've been yeah. writing. You've been writing. Yeah, yeah. We're in edits now, so I'm hoping that it's going to be out by early next year. I'm hoping. Okay. Fantastic. And then I'm forgetting the name, but the British drama that came out that was set in the 80s and 90s, um, recently was on Channel 4, but also aired. It's in the a sin. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And that yeah. one apparently led to a big increase in people getting HIV tests in the UK. Um, but as soon as I said that about like, oh, maybe there's this much more space for people to tell those different stories, I also was like, uh, my research, like my scholarly research is on news deserts and information access inequity. So yeah, there might be more sources, there might be more stories, but who has the privilege of access to them? And finally, in 2021, we are honestly talking talking about access to broadband internet as a social determinant of health, because it is, and we should have been, and, you know, access to credible local news um, written by people who look like you and sound like you, that is a social determinant of health too. So there might be more sources out there, and I'm glad that there are more journalists of color slightly. It's all um, not great. But again, there's inequity when it comes to access to information, and that we know also has an impact on perspectives and on public health. One thing I wanted to ask you internationally, and then I'll get to one other audience question. I have, in my own research, looked at and seen the the maps of structural racism have different symptoms, but the maps are pretty consistent. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this in your work in prisons, neighborhoods around prisons, certainly neighborhoods around jails and social networks around jails were enormous factors for the coronavirus as they are for HIV and TB and all kinds of other infectious diseases. Um, And I've, you know, I've seen that pretty clearly in the United States. I would like to ask you, as someone who's done so much international reporting as well, um, how do you perceive the role of colonialism Mm -hmm. in these ongoing inequities? Because it feels, I remember seeing a, a Twitter image showing the countries asking for the vaccine waiver, the countries trying to uphold the, this was before the U.S., fortunately, you know, has, has come out for the TRIPS waiver, but it could still get holed up by other colonial powers. Um, and how do you see kind of the legacies of colonialism impacting how people interact with viruses around the world? Oh my God, what a great question. There's a book in that, well, it's your book, I think, too. But I see it completely... I see it completely intertwined. 
in terms of where there was genocide, what circumstances that left behind when there was that kind of pillaging by um, colonizers, the way that that kind of uh, yeah, that kind of pillaging robbed lands of their natural resources and relocated people to barren areas and drought stricken areas and decimated traditional ways of healing and community building and caring. So that gets destroyed to my mind, in my mind, when the colonization happens, your infrastructure deteriorates, then they might leave. And then there's the aftermath of colonization. And then, and this is very much my family story, there's the migration patterns. And then there's the set of circumstances that you take with you back to your colonizer's land. Um, and then the substance misuse, the, the results from that, the poverty, the xenophobia that you live with, the Islamophobia, all of that. So I just see that as building into those social determinants that we kind of point to as, oh, this is what puts you at risk of this. And I feel like they are so, those things that make you vulnerable and make you susceptible to poor health, whether it's a virus, whether it's chronic infection, to be honest, although many viruses cause chronic infections and cancers too, to me feel so intertwined with our legacies, our lived experiences of colonization in our homelands, or then when we have to move because of the, the aftermath of colonization. So yeah, that's, that's a deep question. Um, one other question from the audience. Dr. Yasmin's journalistic work is refreshingly partisan. Do you think that kind of taking sides has played a role in your political and medical work in the same way? Or is, it, or is the journalism industry unique in that regard? Can you say the last bit of oh, the smiling too? Hard. Can you say the last bit of the question? Sure. Um, do you think, uh, so you, they're saying that your work is, is take sides. And yeah. do you think taking sides has played a role in your political and medical work in the same way, or is it unique to your journalism work? So no, I hope not. I hope it's not unique to that. I hope it's like in, it seeps through the way I live my life and walk through the world, because again, I just want to smash the idea of objectivity. Nobody is like, this is, it doesn't, how do you do that? It doesn't exist. I would much rather my readers know me and the people who watch my videos know me and know, oh, she was raised in a really religious Muslim community and uh, that she comes from an immigrant family who was really badly impacted by colonization and by the immigration process. Um, I, I would rather people know these things about me and my lived experiences so you can understand the lens through which I look at the world and therefore the biases that I bring because we all have them, we all bring our biases and I mean it sounds simplistic but I say this to my journalism students all the time, it's like better to, to know who's, you have to know your sources, you have to know who is it's not just the outlet you're reading, it's who's the byline is it, or who are they? And if anyone is, I just think it's a pretending game otherwise to, and of course I'm not trying, I don't write op-eds really, I write very few op-eds and I went to journalism school so because I, I wanted to learn how to report and that's what I mostly did. And so I'm trying to bring you different sources but I'm very much framing an argument in a particular way. And I mean, even that point where you pitch a story and you pick up your pen to interview a person you're therefore not interviewing another 10 and therefore you're not telling 10 other stories you're telling this story that's a that's an that's a decision that's a choice like how can you be neutral in any of that so I'd rather just be like here's who I am here's my mission and you know take take that take all that information I was talking with my students yesterday or today about how who you're interviewing I was I was asked a question of getting people on the record and you know, there are various ways you can get officials on the record, but I also said there are often people who will go on the record who are affected by what you're writing about, who are not typically asked. Yeah. And that's part of our, our work is discerning who you want to listen to. You don't, the person who doesn't want to be on the record, who might seem the sexiest because they have the most formal power, might not be the most, per, most interesting person to, to speak to, nor necessarily the most informed I mean, about like, the impacts of what you're writing about. Like, when was the last time you read a story that was about houseless people that mentioned or interviewed a houseless person? It's actually pretty rare, unless it's a story directly about something those people are doing in their community. I read a fantastic story in The Guardian this morning about a community of houseless people in West Oakland who are organizing and creating a village. But many times you read a story about that issue 
and it actually will not have a single houseless person in it. So yeah, those decisions we make, those very deliberate decisions, often we're supposed to be shining a light and holding the powerful to account and all of that, but we're often excluding um, the very people that are, have lived experiences, not just that are affected by it, but can give us perspective and insight into that issue. So yeah, look out for that next time you read a story about homelessness or houseless people. Uh, would you like to read a couple more poems? Oh, sure. Um, I will read a poem called All the News That's Fit to Print, which you might have seen that title somewhere else. All the News That's Fit to Print. Dark deaths matter more if they speak English, if our nurses are sent to help and return with trinkets, tans and meningitis. Editorial judgment dictates at least 16 black people must die to equal one white man's death. 43, if the outbreak is old news, does not involve profuse hemorrhage, a former colony, or biblical references. Subtract one dozen if our boys are deployed to clean up their mess. Add nine if babies are disintegrating in shallow graves, but restrict to 12 inches maximum. Even maple syrup tastes bitter, licked off fingers inked with destitution. Buttercream pancakes stick in the throat, and it's all happening so far, far away. Follow the story with one reporter who knows nothing of PPE, shrouds, and ritual mourning. Send four photogs, overuse two underpaid local fixers if deadlines for awards are approaching. Win a Pulitzer for photos of brown faces eating expired medicines smeared in peanut butter aid. Say it is a gift from the American people. Say it was worth the ink. That was really beautiful. And um, listening to it, I've, I've read it before, but listening to it and hearing it, it, it reinforces my desire to teach poetry to journalism students because the language is so evocative of an experience for you and I think also for the people that you're writing about. Um, and you're doing, so I don't know if this was conscious on your part or not, but you're evoking different senses. I, I so often see, and I'm sad because we've been in a pandemic, I haven't gotten to teach my field reporting class in person yet um, in my time uh, at Northwestern so far. Um, but we're often over-reliant as journalists on, uh, certainly on a sense of able-bodiedness and of the five senses, most often on sight and sound. And so one thing I really admire about that poem is you're, you're giving these things that are evocative of touch, that are evocative of taste. And these are things that really transport the listener to an experience um, in a way that I think can, can really help bridge things for, for the reader and the writer. Thank you. And I'm really thoughtful about something that Roger Robinson, um, a British Jamaican poet, and Kwame Dawes, who's I think is also West Indian, but I think he's based in the States. Uh, both of those poet, poets talk about or describe poems as empathy machines. Mm -hmm. And I think especially when I felt like not just a journalist, but a jaded journalist, and I felt like a journalist who's throwing trying to build narrative, but often throwing lots of numbers out at people, that poems can be really powerful in connecting those senses and doing what that high school student said so eloquently this morning about like, it was jarring and confusing going from babies disintegrating in shallow graves to thinking about maple syrup and buttercream pancakes, right? And licking your fingers from a tasty brunch. But I think that's, that's the work that poems can do and that I want my poems to do. Well, I think we have time for one more poem do you have oh. one more you'd like to share oh sure what's the last one? Oh, maybe i'll read since i talked about feeling. i mean we can go a little longer if you want to but was... since i'm feeling jaded or since i was talking about feeling jaded rather um okay i'll read two then okay. i'll read this one which is next to an uh, outbreak Oh, this one. I'll read this one. This is called Life of the Party. At cocktail parties, when a guest hiccups, I am that guy who slides up and says, did you know hiccups are caused by irritation of the phrenic nerve? They never know. 
I am slick with it. Run my martini core fingers along their necks, trace the course of the nerve south of the collarbone into the back black dress. So slick, I joined the public health service to pay off student loans and came to Africa for the Instagram opportunities. Stories for years and two first author papers. I can last 46 minutes inside a hazmat suit inside the white tent. Surrounded by a cacophony of hiccups, they cheep, cheep, cheep like chicks. I drum the beat on the anti-cubital fossa of the girl whose blood I will drain, tell her, did you know hiccups plus fever mean you have Ebola? Did you know hiccups mean 82% of you will die from it? Hmm. So that's, you know, based on some composite characters. Um, I'll read one. Oh. I'll read this one, it's called Syndemics. First I was born brown and then a woman, or the other way around, out came woman and Muslim followed. My uncle called me lighty as a term of endearment, so maybe I was not brown to begin with. Yes, I became brown in college, become brown every time I'm in a room of white women, pale into insignificance. And woman only with my feet in metal stirrups, queer only with my tongue inside another woman. First, my shopping bag splits, then a jar of olives smashes open. First, I look for help in other faces, then I spear olives with my nails. When I open my mouth, long vowels betray my mother's village. First, I ask for a new bag. First, I plead forgiveness. A brown figure makes a scene, a crouching woman grabs her olives, a hijabi picks up cracked glass. Which one of them is me? Mm. And how then, did that? Sure. Yeah, go on, go well, on. Well, well, it sounds like you're looking for one more. I just want to ask yeah. you, how did that poem um, come into the collection around yeah. viruses? Right. So, you know, the title is Syndemics, which um, for anyone who's not heard that term, um, it got banded around a lot at the beginning of the pandemic. Actually, I haven't heard it come up so much in reporting recently, but syndemics are kind of when you have concurrent epidemics, which is actually pretty, pretty common, you know. Um, and so I was thinking about overlapping identities and thinking about the speaker, the maybe the maker of the poem, but the speaker too, being many things at once, which many of us are, whether that is a, a journalist and a scientist um, and a poet. Um, and then the, the speaker of the poem being a woman, being a brown woman, being a queer woman, being a hijabi, and thinking about how we cross or hide those different identities and boundaries. So that's what I was thinking of there, kind of interrogating more the voice of the speaker of that poem and perhaps the maker of the poems too. I always like using that as an out. Um, I was going to look for one more and I'll read the final poem okay. uh, in the book, which is the last poem that I wrote and one of my favorites because having been in America for 10 years and having worked in the National Health Service in England and like complaining about it a lot when I was in it, uh, I have grown to become very fond of this idea of healthcare that's free at the point of care. So this is my love letter to the National Health Service and it's called NHS Zindabad. And Zindabad is a word that I know from Urdu, but I think it's in a lot of Persian derived languages that means long live. NHS Zindabad. The coal miner's son delivered me through a gash, from comfy belly into Thatcher's ungloved hand, said, this is your religion now, let it live. So I raised a new fist and cried, NHS, Zindabad. In this country where nobody is well, the lifeblood eats his midnight tea in the hospital canteen. Black pudding, baked beans and buttery toast before four more wet babies are pulled batteries replaced and finally the doctor loosens loosens his bug falls into a bleepless sleep whisper in your dreams nhs zindabad once healers in our english land toiled gardens in the punjab sailed ships across the atlantic so we could be born in george Eliot's name these six streets slick with immigrant electrolytes pay slips light ash cash heavy 
We burn joints, massage souls, curse the politrican liars while we heal. Abscesses need draining, bedpans need changing, and the Prime Minister will never say NHS Zindabad. In these dark, cold days, he keeps trying to starve it, keeps trying to starve us under budget cuts. My colour's blood sweetens, arteries tense with austerity and rage. I soothe her with this story. In Enrica, the insulin would cost your left leg and gullima finger. Swallow the bitter pill, auntie, and plead with Allah, NHS, Zindabad. Child of a nurse, lover of men, heed this poet's warning. When it dies, we die. Let it live, let it live, let us live. That's so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, a wonderful poem to end with. Um, thanks so much for having this conversation with me. Thank you, uh, thank you Haymarket. And um, I love this book. I hope people will read it, buy it, and teach it journalistically, medical settings, just for your soul as poetry. So if we'll, you ended saying NHS Zindabad, and I will end saying if God is a virus, Zindabad. I hope this book has a beautiful life and I'm sure that it will touching people around the world. Thank you so Thank much, Stephen. My pleasure. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks everyone.